How's it going folks? Welcome to another discussion video. If you like this video, be sure to leave a like afterwards and share it, as well as give me your feedback in the comments. The focus of this video today is the nation of China. It is a very long one, and it took a long time to write, but at last, I present to you my take on what if the Chinese nationalists won the Chinese Civil War. Now let's get into it. After millennia of imperial rule, by 1900, China found itself teetering on the brink of collapse after spending the last century dealing with back-to-back -back crises, including two drug wars with Britain, a rebellion in which a man who claimed to be the younger brother of Jesus Christ led a revolt that killed 30 million people, a war with Japan over Korea and Taiwan that the Chinese brutally lost, and another rebellion in 1900 which caused an eight-nation alliance of Italy, Austria-Hungary, France, the United States, the German Empire, the Russian Empire, the Japanese Empire, and the British Empire to invade China and put down the rebellion without so much as a declaration of war. In 1908, conservative members of the Chinese imperial court poisoned the reformist Guangzhou Emperor of China. His successor was a two-year-old child, the Zhuantong Emperor, commonly known by his given name Aisen Jodo Puyi, who became the last emperor of China in 1908. With this disastrous decision came the true end of the Chinese Empire. As the twilight of imperial China fell upon them, Chinese revolutionaries began to plan the creation of a new China. The most famous of these was Dr. Sun Yat-sen, one of the most prominent philosophers and revolutionaries of the late imperial era. In 1911, a popular uprising toppled the old imperial order in China and saw the proclamation of the Republic of China, inspired by the ideals of Dr. Sun Yat-sen and the West. However, this new republican government was weak and soon fragmented, and from 1916 to 1927, China was engulfed in war and anarchy as ex-members of the military and regional governors fought for control over small provinces across China as warlords. Furthermore, during this period, the Empire of Japan took note of China's weakness and began planning for future colonization of the country. This era of Chinese history is aptly called the Warlord Era. However, the great Dr. Sun Yat-sen never abandoned hopes of true democracy in China and persevered in his fight for freedom. After forming his own political party, the Guomindang, also known as the Chinese Nationalist Party, in the early 1920s, he began to fight for Chinese reunification. Furthermore, Dr. Sun Yat-sen also invited the then unknown Chinese Communist Party to join his coalition in a united front to crush the warlords and reunify China. By the mid-1920s, the Chinese nationalists had amassed enough support to start a military campaign to reunify China and destroy the warlords, called the Northern Expedition. Sadly, however, in 1925, shortly after the beginning of the Northern Expedition, Dr. Sun Yat-sen fell ill and died. Immediately after his death, a power vacuum emerged. Sun Yat-sen's political protege, Wang Jingwei, claimed the mantle of his successor, but was overpowered and outmaneuvered by Sun Yat-sen's military protege, General Chiang Kai-shek, who crushed Wang Jingwei's attempts to form a government and took power for himself. General Chiang Kai-shek would lead the nationalists to victory in the Northern Expedition in 1927, and afterwards became President of China with dictatorial powers. However, just as Chiang had reunified China, trouble reared its head once more. Soon after taking power, General Chiang Kai-shek turned against the communists within his coalition and launched a bloody purge of them within the cities. Communists were massacred throughout cities of China, with the survivors fleeing for their lives. Initially, the nationalists' purges were successful, and the Chinese communists lost their foothold within urban areas. By 1930, the Chinese communist movement was on the brink of extinction, and the survivors had regrouped in China's Jiangxi province. Following this, the Chinese nationalists began a series of encirclement campaigns to destroy the communists once and for all. Unfortunately for the nationalists, the communists managed to defeat the first two campaigns, and the third campaign was cut short due to the 1931 Japanese invasion of Manchuria, one of the northernmost regions of China. The invasion ended in a decisive Japanese victory over Chinese forces, and Japan established a puppet state called Manchu Kuo in their newly seized land, run by the last emperor of China, Aisen Jodo Puyi, who ruled until 1945. Resistance to this invasion was minimal, and the ensuing seizure of this major region of China by Japan was considered a national embarrassment. Chiang Kai-shek, then leading the fight against the communists, was forced to abandon the Third Encirclement Campaign amidst national outrage over his focus on fighting the communists versus the Japanese. Although the Fifth Encirclement Campaign would later successfully dislodge the communists and send them into a tactical retreat known as the Long March, 
the Third Encirclement Campaign represented one of the best chances for the Chinese nationalists to crush the communists once and for all. The Chinese communists would barely survive the encirclement campaigns, but luckily for them, Japanese imperialism would ensure the Chinese communist movement's survival. In 1937, the Empire of Japan launched a full-scale invasion of China, and Chiang Kai-shek was kidnapped and forced by his own subordinates to cease his increasingly unpopular war against the communists and ally with them to fight the Japanese during World War II. To make matters worse, Wang Jingwei defected to the Japanese and betrayed China, running a pro-Japanese puppet government in Nanjing. The war would be brutal for China, and upwards of 20 million Chinese people were killed during the war. After the Empire of Japan surrendered at the end of World War II, and China emerged victorious, the Chinese nationalists and communists commenced fighting once more. However, while Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists took the brunt of casualties in the war fighting the Japanese, Mao Zedong's communists engaged in as little fighting as possible to conserve manpower. Furthermore, many errors were made by incompetent nationalist leaders during the war, including General Chiang Kai-shek himself killing hundreds of thousands of civilians by flooding the Yellow River in a failed attempt to stop the Japanese advance. Accordingly, after Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government defeated the Japanese, the reinvigorated communists, led by Mao Zedong, capitalized on the weakness of the nationalist forces, managed to defeat them, and won the Chinese Civil War, taking control of China in 1949 and staying in power until present day. Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists retreated to the island of Taiwan, where Chiang ruled as a dictator until he died in 1975, and where his nationalist party remains to this day. In the 1980s, the people of Taiwan successfully ended the nationalist dictatorship through peaceful protest, and established a multi-party democracy on the island, which continues to prosper into present day. As we can see, there were multiple points in the 20th century history of China where things could have gone very differently. There are dozens of what-ifs one can make based on this period alone. However, the one I wish to explore today is a popular one, albeit with my own unique twist to it. What if the Chinese nationalists had won the Civil War? Let's begin. Our first point of divergence is in Beijing. The year is 1924. It was in this year that warlords fought a battle for control of the old capital city. The victorious warlord, Feng Yuxiang, decided that the Zhuangtang Emperor and his court should be expelled from their home in the Forbidden City, and so he did just that. The Zhuangtang Emperor was abruptly notified of his impending expulsion, with only three hours to pack his things and leave. In our timeline, his advisor, Zheng Zhaozhu, successfully convinced Emperor Zhuangtang to seek refuge with the Japanese authorities in China, as although the Emperor's first choice was to seek exile with the British authorities, they took too long to respond to his request, and by the time the British approved taking him in, the Emperor had already been taken in by the Japanese. With this, we make one small change. Unlike in our timeline, where Zheng Zhaozhu convinced the emperor to take refuge in the Japanese legation, in this alternate timeline, the Zhuangtang emperor's British advisor, Reginald Johnston, manages to convince the British to take the emperor in sooner, and thus the emperor never becomes allied with the Japanese and never ascends to become the puppet leader of Manchukuo. Following this chain of events, the Emperor and his party leave for British Hong Kong with Johnston, and history is changed forever. Zhang Zhaozhu departs that night for the Japanese legation, resolute that China needs imperial rule once more. Later, the Emperor's pro-nationalist cousin, Pu Ru, joins him in Hong Kong and begins to convince the Emperor that the nationalist cause does have some merit despite its shortcomings. Another change to the timeline we will make is regarding the fate of Mr. Sun Dianying, who in our timeline was a nationalist allied bandit leader who looted the imperial tombs in 1928. This action drove the emperor to develop a deep hatred of Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists. However, instead of desecrating the imperial tombs, Sun Dianying instead dies during a military campaign in 1926, ensuring the plot to loot the imperial tombs is never fully realized. In 1931, the Empire of Japan begins its imperialist conquest of China, beginning with the invasion of Manchuria. After staging a false flag attack in the city of Mukden, the Japanese claim this as their casus belli and begin a total invasion of the region of Manchuria. In our timeline, this was done with the intent afterwards to set up a puppet government that based its legitimacy on the support of the former imperial nobility. 
However, without the Zhuantong Emperor in their clutches, the Japanese have to resort to an alternate plan for their puppet government in Manchuria. Since his expulsion from the Forbidden City in 1924, the former Emperor of China has been living a life of luxury in British Hong Kong, along with the aging members of his former court and some family members, including his father, Prince Chun, and his cousin, Pu Ru. In the years following his arrival in Hong Kong, the emperor also had all of his imperial consorts, as well as his own wife, Empress Wanrong, abandon him due to neglect and mistreatment. However, the emperor's lonely life of luxury abruptly changes on September 18, 1931, when news of the attack on Manchuria reaches the emperor in Hong Kong. At first unsure of what to do, Emperor Zhuantong is encouraged by his cousin Pu Ru to speak out against the Japanese invasion. Pu Ru then facilitates the establishment of a direct line of communication between Emperor Zhuantong and Chiang Kai-shek's government in Nanjing. Within a few days, nationalist representatives are sent to Hong Kong by President Chiang to meet with Emperor Zhuantong, with Pu Ru as the mediator. The emperor is persuaded by nationalist agents to speak out against Japanese aggression in Manchuria in exchange for a handsome payment and a symbolic role within the legislative yuan as the representative of the Manchu people. After much thought and with Pu Ru and his father's urging, Emperor Zhuantong tentatively accepts the nationalist government's offer, going on to denounce the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. The unpopular former emperor's denouncement of the Japanese invasion goes unnoticed by the vast majority of Chinese. However, among the Manchu minority within China, various Manchu monarchist groups are formed that fund and support the anti-Japanese volunteer armies in Manchuria, led by the nationalist general Ma Zhanshan, who is appointed by the nationalist government to lead the defense of Manchuria. Unlike in our timeline, where General Ma was left to fight the Japanese without sufficient monetary support, in this timeline, General Ma has more funds to draw from thanks to the funds and arms supplied by the anti-Japanese Manchu monarchist groups. While the Japanese initially make quick work of Chinese forces near the border with Japanese Korea, eventually they face sizable resistance in the largest battle of the invasion of Manchuria. On November 4, 1931, General Ma Zhanshan's army meets Japanese forces at Nanjiang Bridge. The Battle of Nanjiang Bridge, in our timeline a small but crucial skirmish that allowed the Japanese to steamroll Chinese forces in Manchuria, is, in this timeline, instead a massive battle due to increased financial support from the Manchu elite. General Ma Zhanshan's troops win the Battle of Nanjiang Bridge, and General Ma becomes a national hero in China, later being personally honored by the nationalist government for his valor. After his victory at Nanjiang Bridge, General Ma Zhanshan is reinforced by the Manchu general Aisen Juro Jichia, who is inspired by the Zhuangdong Emperor to fight the Japanese in Manchuria. Together, the two generals form the Manchu Salvation Army, a militia under the authority of the nationalist government. As a result of the anti-Japanese forces lasting longer than in our timeline, there is less pressure on Chiang Kai-shek to immediately focus on Manchuria when General Ma Zhanshan can defend it alone. Without the pressure to shore up China's defenses immediately, Chiang Kai-shek is allowed just a few more weeks to crush the communists before he must return to Nanjing and address the developing crisis in Manchuria. This is important because when the Japanese invaded Manchuria on September 18, 1931, Chiang Kai-shek was in the midst of his third encirclement campaign meant to deal a killing blow to the Chinese Communist movement in Jiangxi province. With time now on his side, General Chiang Kai-shek regroups his nationalist forces for an all-out assault on the communists. The communists, who'd thus far been successful and began going on the offensive, are caught off guard by the suddenly reinvigorated nationalist troops, and after several human wave attacks, the Chinese nationalists manage to breach the communists' defenses. The communists, already spread thin, are unable to survive the onslaught and ensuing chaos. By September 20th, the Chinese nationalists have assumed near total control of the formerly communist-controlled areas of Jiangxi province, and the following day comes the last battle of the Chinese Civil War, which, in this timeline, is simply referred to as the Communist Insurrection. On September 21st, 1931, General Chiang Kai-shek and his troops take the communist provincial capital city of Ruijin and massacre its citizens. Major communist figures, including Zhu De, Zhou Enlai, and Mao Zedong are captured and killed while Ruijin burns to the ground. On September 23rd, with a small garrison established in Jiangxi province to maintain order, Chiang Kai-shek returns to Nanjing to begin preparations for the defense of China. After the deaths of most of the communist leadership in the Ruijin massacre, the communist movement in China begins to crumble. In the vacuum left by the massacre, the most prominent surviving Chinese communist is Wang Ming, who was in Moscow at the time of the massacre. 
Unbeknownst to Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists, Wang Ming covertly evacuates the children of the highest-ranking CCP leadership to the Soviet Union. Wang Ming greets the children when they arrive in Moscow and promises them that one day, all of them will avenge their parents' deaths. Sadly, after a year of fierce resistance, on February 4, 1933, the last free city in Manchuria, Harbin, falls to the Japanese with the Manchu Salvation Army evacuating their troops to nationalist-controlled territory, but vowing to reclaim Manchuria. Although the Manchu Salvation Army lost the battle for Manchuria, their defiance against Japan changed the history of China forever. Because the former emperor denounced the Japanese invasion, many influential Manchu political and military figures who supported the Japanese in our timeline instead find themselves in an uneasy alliance with the Republic of China. Without the support of the last emperor and his court, the Japanese cannot frame their invasion as anything but an imperialist land grab before the League of Nations. Meanwhile, the Manchu Salvation Army leadership has retreated to Chinese-controlled provinces on the border with Manchuria and begun to coordinate an insurgency within Manchuria alongside General Zhang Zhuiliang. As the Japanese begin harshly cracking down on the Manchu insurgency, the security situation in Manchuria slowly stabilizes to the point where the Japanese begin constructing a new puppet government to lessen the burden of ruling their stolen land. The Japanese search for a ruler of Manchu Kuo in this timeline had not been easy. Almost all of Emperor Zhuantong's family and court had sided with him. Begrudgingly, the Japanese settle on Aisun Juro Jian Yu, also known in Japanese as Yoshiko Kawashima, to take the throne of Manchu Kuo. Jian Yu, who was a relative of Emperor Zhuantong and a Manchu princess, had enough legitimacy to be put on the throne, although she was far from the first choice. Given up for adoption by her father, who was a Manchu prince, after the Manchu dynasty was overthrown in 1911, Jian Yu was raised by a Japanese mercenary and experienced a deeply unhappy childhood, to put it lightly. Furthermore, she was deeply dedicated to the Japanese cause of Pan-Asianism under Japanese hegemony and reliable as an ally within Manchukuo. On March 1, 1934, Aisun Joro Jian Yu is inaugurated as the Empress of Manchukuo before a crowd of spectators in Mukden, the capital of Manchukuo. Zheng Zhaozhu is sworn in as the first Prime Minister of Manchukuo on that same day. Now, unlike in our timeline, where Emperor Zhuantong was merely a figurehead with no real power, Empress Jian Yu is more competent than her relative, and is accordingly afforded more power than him. Empress Jian Yu, as commander-in-chief of all Manchu Kuo imperial forces, quickly begins a great terror across Manchu Kuo at the order of the Japanese, eliminating dissidents and thought criminals while emphasizing a shift away from China and towards Manchu and Japanese culture. Over one million people are killed during her reign of terror alone. What this alternate Manchu Kuo regime lacks in legitimacy, it makes up for in increased competence. General Ma Jianshan's valiant defense of Manchuria has inspired much of China, even those who thought a war against Japan would be unwinnable beforehand. Chinese politician Wang Jingwei, in our timeline a defeatist who ended up siding with the Japanese during the war, is instead convinced to remain loyal to Chiang Kai-shek's regime after witnessing the bravery of General Ma's troops in Manchuria, as well as the terror imposed upon innocent Chinese by Empress Zhang Yu in Manchukuo. Wang Jingwei begins to believe that no matter how difficult the coming fight may be, China must fight back. Despite their mutual hatred of each other, Chiang Kai-shek makes superficial overtures to Wang Jingwei, including making him premier of the Republic of China, going on to use Wang's left-wing and revolutionary credentials to make the nationalists more appealing to the peasants of China, to fill the vacuum left by the communists and shore up his support with the working class of China. With the communist threat eliminated, Chiang Kai-shek can focus all of his efforts on modernizing China and preparing his military for the inevitable Japanese invasion. However, this is further helped by the fact that Wang Jingwei and his faction reluctantly work with Chiang Kai-shek to help realize his goals by mobilizing the working class and peasantry to support the nationalist cause, despite his deep hatred personally of Chiang. In Hebei province, the Manchu Salvation Army engages in an insurgency in Manchuria backed by the forces of the young marshal, Zhang Zhuiliang. Ma Zhanshan, in this timeline, becomes the face of the Chinese guerrilla resistance movement instead of Mao Zedong. Furthermore, the guerrillas of China are intimately linked to the nationalist cause instead of the communist one. Meanwhile, the world looks on in horror as Empress Jian Yu converts Manchu Kuo into a totalitarian and militaristic nation on the backs of Chinese slave labor.
Jian Yu and her Japanese bosses are coordinating closely on a pivotal first strike against the Nationalists and finalizing their plans by 1937. On July 8, 1937, just as in our timeline, following a confrontation between Chinese and Japanese forces in Beijing, full-scale war breaks out between the Empire of Japan and the Republic of China. The Second Sino-Japanese War goes slightly differently than in our timeline. With Mao Zedong and the Communists slaughtered six years prior, there is no second united front. Instead, Chiang Kai-shek manages to field a slightly more effective fighting force against the Japanese, both because he'd had six years of peacetime to prepare his defenses, and because the Chinese guerrillas in this timeline report directly to his subordinate, Ma Zhanshan. General Ma's guerrillas make a hasty retreat from the northern provinces bordering Manchuria at the nationalist government's behest. Chiang Kai-shek in this timeline is also better advised, as he retains not only his own strategists, but also those who were loyal to Wang Jingwei. Nationalist forces confront the Japanese in Shanghai on August 13, 1937. However, unlike in our timeline, where the nationalists lost the vast majority of their elite units in Shanghai, in this alternate timeline they only lose roughly a quarter of them, because of the additional support of the Manchu Salvation Army. As a result of this strengthened defense of Shanghai, it falls to the Japanese on Christmas Day 1937, a whole month later than it did in our timeline. Because of this, over the course of the Battle of Shanghai, Wang Jingwei manages to successfully evacuate nearly the entire city of Nanjing, avoiding the Nanjing Massacre. Wang Jingwei, because of his left-wing politics and revolutionary credentials, is put in charge of civilian affairs during the war by Chiang Kai-shek, to even further cement his good reputation with the peasantry. Wang's actions in leading the people of Nanjing to safety sharply contrast with his actions in our timeline, in which he betrayed his country and presided over his own people's suffering at the hands of his Japanese bosses. Wang Jingwei goes on to evacuate more major cities across the Chinese coast before the Japanese advance, and leads these refugees to safety in Sichuan province, close to the wartime Chinese capital of Chongqing. This mass exodus led by Wang is later referred to by historians as the Long March. Instead of a reorganized puppet government headed by Wang Jingwei being created in Japanese-occupied China, the newly conquered areas are instead given to the empire of Manchu Kuo. Empress Jian Yu moves Manchu Kuo's capital to Beijing and takes up residence in the Forbidden City to the joy of the Japanese, who paint the whole affair as the Manchus reclaiming China from European colonialism and the corrupt nationalist sellouts. However, due to Manchu Kuo's newly acquired territory, Emperor Xian Yu's rule becomes wildly unstable, and she finds herself constantly putting down revolts against her rule in the newly occupied areas. For the remainder of the war, things go more or less the same as in our timeline, except the nationalists manage to survive the war without any major massacres in key cities such as Nanjing. Furthermore, the Manchurian guerrillas managed to delay the Japanese advance to a slow enough pace that Chiang Kai-shek never even considers flooding the Yellow River, unlike in our timeline where he did, and ended up killing hundreds of thousands of his own people while failing to slow the Japanese. As Wang Jingwei works to settle the countless displaced refugees and President Chiang Kai-shek works to ensure China's defenses remain robust, President Chiang sends his wife, Madam Chiang Kai-shek, and the former emperor across the world to garner support for China, because Chiang sees the emperor as a useful propaganda symbol. The emperor's status and title draw more people to China's plight than in our timeline, and as a result, more money is raised for the injured and the refugees within China. On December 7, 1941, the Empire of Japan bombs Pearl Harbor and drags the U.S. into both World War II and the Second Sino-Japanese War. When this happens, victory becomes assured for the nationalists. Without a communist insurgency in this timeline, and with the war going slightly better, Chiang Kai-shek's plans for a post-war world are much more complex than in our timeline. After all, as soon as the Japanese are defeated in China, he will become the undisputed ruler of the nation. The nation of Mongolia's status within this timeline has played out much the same as in our timeline thus far. While Outer Mongolia was a Soviet satellite state, Inner Mongolia was torn apart by war, with a pro-Japanese puppet state called Meng Jiang being set up and run by the Mongol nationalist Dem Chug Dongrub. In our timeline, at the war's end, Joseph Stalin told Chiang Kai-shek that if he recognized Mongolian independence, Stalin would cease support for the Chinese communists. Chiang Kai-shek reluctantly agreed. However, this conversation goes very differently in our alternate timeline. In the summer of 1945, 
Stalin tells Chinese envoy T.V. Soong about his plans to ensure Mongolian independence post-war, and attempts to convince him of why the Soviets needed to keep Mongolia within their sphere of influence. However, with the Chinese communists having been wiped out a decade prior, Soong flat out refuses. Stalin, with no counteroffer or leverage, relents, confident that, protest as they may, the Chinese will not dare to make a move on Mongolia and risk war with the Soviet Union. When Soong informs Chiang of his conversation with Stalin, Chiang Kai-shek reiterates his refusal to accept Mongolian independence, setting the stage for a later confrontation with the Soviet Union based on China's refusal to allow any former Chinese territory to be under communist rule. With Chiang's government safe within inner China, and the Japanese combating a strong nationalist guerrilla movement led by the elusive general Ma Zhanshan, the Japanese occupation of China is much more difficult for Japan than in our timeline. Crucially for the Chinese war effort, with the situation across the Japanese-occupied areas much more chaotic, Chiang Kai-shek's forces never become overconfident as the two sides never reach a stalemate. Following a tip-off from the French regarding an impending offensive by the Japanese, the Chinese successfully mount a preemptive strike against the Japanese before they can launch Operation Ichigo, which was a military campaign that decimated the Chinese war effort in our timeline. Going into winter 1944, the Axis powers falter across the world, and with Chiang's forces in Chongqing reinvigorated, he mounts a massive offensive against the Japanese and the Empress, coordinating this offensive with several terror attacks by Ma Zhanshan that take out key infrastructure and supply lines across occupied China and Manchukuo. Chiang manages to recapture much of southern China by early 1945, as Japanese forces are recalled to the home islands in preparation for the inevitable United States invasion. Upon hearing this, Empress Zhan Yu has her prime minister, Zheng Zhaozhu, executed in a fit of rage. On April 2, 1945, Chiang's troops retake Nanjing, and Wang Jingwei immediately sets up a relief effort for southern China based in Nanjing. On June 1, 1945, Ma Zhanshan's guerrillas launch an uprising and take over much of Manchuria in the name of the Republic of China. Empress Zhang Yu is now cut off from Japanese supply lines, and all Japanese support for her government disappears as the prospect of an American invasion looms over the shores of Japan. Empress Zhang Yu decides to consolidate her forces and recalls all of her remaining loyal troops to Beijing. On July 1, 1945, Chiang Kai-shek meets with Ma Zhanshan at a nationalist encampment near Beijing. That same day, the two generals begin the last battle of the war in China. As Beijing is besieged, Empress Zhang Yu orders her troops to fight to the death, and her few remaining loyalists follow her commands. As the city is rushed by nationalist Chinese troops, Zhang Yu's men quickly crumble before the onslaught. Defiant to the very end, Empress Zhang Yu calmly walks to the Imperial Garden with a katana gifted to her by the Emperor of Japan. With her last remaining Japanese advisor as her kaishakunin, Empress Zhang Yu commits seppuku in the Imperial Garden as Beijing burns. Chinese forces breach the Forbidden City to discover the grisly scene. With the death of Empress Zhang Yu and the fall of Beijing to Chinese forces, Japanese-occupied China falls into chaos. The Japanese puppet state of Mengjiang crumbles, and the Mongol puppet leader, Demchuk Dongrub, is taken prisoner by nationalist forces and put under house arrest in Nanjing. On August 6, 1945, an atomic bomb is detonated by the United States over Hiroshima, with Nagasaki being hit by another atomic bomb three days later. Following this, on August 15, 1945, the Empire of Japan surrenders to Allied forces and is occupied by the United States military. In the aftermath of the Japanese surrender, Chiang Kai-shek goes on air to give a victory speech to the Chinese nation, much like in our timeline. Furthermore, Chiang ensures that his propagandists spread the news of his exploits across China, and the Japanese defeat ensures steady support for Chiang's government from a majority of China going into the latter half of the 1940s. Following the end of the war, Chiang Kai-shek and Ma Zhanshan managed to outmaneuver the Soviet Union and secure Manchuria for the nationalists. Following this, Chiang bestows upon Ma Zhanshan the honored saber of the Awakened Lion, which is the highest honor within the Republic of China's military, and installs him as the temporary governor of newly liberated Manchuria before elections can be held amongst the three provinces that comprise the region. After this, Chiang Kai-shek realizes that he must also move quickly to stabilize the rapidly deteriorating situation in Korea. 
Unlike in our timeline, where communist-occupied Manchuria gave the Soviet Union easy access to northern Korea and caused the United States and Soviet Union to partition Korea, in this timeline this never occurs with a nationalist-controlled Manchuria. Chiang Kai-shek summons Korean independence leader and ally of the Chinese nationalists, Kim Gu, to Manchuria alongside Korean general Yi Chong Chan. Together, the two Korean independence fighters lead the Korean Liberation Army across the border into Korea to accept the Japanese surrender, aided by Chiang Kai-shek's Chinese nationalist troops. The Korean Liberation Army reaches Seoul on August 25, 1945, and it is there that Kim Gu proclaims the birth of the Republic of Korea, with himself as interim president. Chiang Kai-shek's advisors and military help Kim Gu to rapidly establish his new government's authority across the peninsula for the rest of 1945, in a period later referred to as the Chinese occupation of Korea. On January 1, 1946, the nationalist troops leave Korea in Kim Gu's capable hands, with the Koreans themselves grateful for China's swift action in stabilizing the country after the war and helping the extremely popular Kim Gu take power as president. Going forward, relations between the Republic of China and the Republic of Korea are very close and friendly. Within mainland China, the rest of 1945 is spent beginning reconstruction efforts across the nation, as well as re-establishing Chinese authority across the lands formerly claimed by Imperial China. In a speech to a crowd in Nanjing in September 1945, President Chiang Kai-shek announces the birth of a new program called the Great Leap Forward, which seeks to rapidly industrialize China through investments and loans from the United States and other allied powers. Furthermore, President Chiang, as China's dictator, mobilizes the working class to accomplish his goals, regardless of the human cost. Peasants and workers are regularly worked to death, and any protests against Chiang's rule are violently suppressed, all to ensure the success of his efforts. Furthermore, the second goal of the Great Leap Forward program is to fully reunify China and end the century of humiliation. The island of Taiwan is returned to China in September 1945, after 50 years of Japanese rule. Nationalist official Chen Yi is appointed governor of Taiwan province, but is later removed from office and executed after thousands of Taiwanese people are killed in a massacre on February 28, 1947. Later on, Taiwan becomes a major manufacturing hub famous for its delicious local cuisine. Another quandary faced by Chiang's government is the issue of ethnic unrest in Xinjiang province, as the native Uyghurs of the area have been in revolt against Chinese rule since 1944, with Soviet and Mongolian support, which is termed the Illy Rebellion. Before Chiang Kai-shek can realize his future designs for the northern region of China, he knows he must crush the Illy Rebellion. With no civil war to fight, the nationalist army is much better equipped and prepared to handle the rebellion, and in late 1945, Chiang orders a troop surge across Xinjiang province to crush the rebellion, which ends up being successful due to a lack of other threats. The Soviet Union protests Chiang's actions on the international stage, but their protests are only supported by fellow communist nations. Chinese envoys rebuff this by emphasizing that China's territorial integrity will not be challenged by outside parties as it was during the imperial era. On February 1st, 1946, Masud Sabri, a Uyghur Muslim member of the Nationalist Party and an ally of Chiang Kai-shek, is installed as governor of Xinjiang province and manages to calm the situation there by using nationalist forces sparingly and focusing on public outreach. By the late 1940s, the situation in Xinjiang province has cooled somewhat, as the Uyghurs are allowed to retain their language, culture, and faith so long as they remain loyal to the Chinese government. However, separatism is still harshly punished. On February 30, 1945, Hong Kong had been liberated from Japanese control by the Chinese National Revolutionary Army, but the question of who should control Hong Kong remained in limbo. In our timeline, U.S. President Roosevelt had promised Madame Chiang Kai-shek that Hong Kong would be transferred back to the Republic of China after the war, but sadly, China was in chaos and very weak after the war, so the British maintained control of Hong Kong. However, in this alternate timeline, with China on the mend and without civil unrest, the British reluctantly cede Hong Kong to the Chinese government on October 31st, 1945. The return of Hong Kong makes an excellent birthday present for China's dictator. However, unlike Hong Kong, Macau remains under Portuguese control, for now. Throughout the coming decades, Hong Kong rises to become a major financial hub within China and internationally as well. After securing Chinese control of Taiwan, Xinjiang, and Hong Kong, by 1947, Chiang Kai-shek sets his sights on Tibet. 
While Britain covertly attempts to preserve Tibetan independence to counter growing Chinese influence in the region, their attempts fail after tens of thousands of nationalist Chinese troops march into Tibet on the 6th of March, 1947. The Chinese invasion is swift and resolute, with Tibet's armed forces struggling to resist the onslaught. The commander-in-chief of the Tibetan armed forces, Ngapo, faces off against the Chinese in the Battle of Chamdol, which ends with Tibetan forces being completely crushed by the Chinese National Revolutionary Army. The nationalist victory at the Battle of Chamdol marks the end of coordinated Tibetan resistance, and by the end of March 1947, Tibet is fully under Chinese control, with the capital of Lhasa being captured soon after the Tibetan defeat at Chamdol. On May 23, 1947, the 13 point agreement given to Tibet by the Republic of China is signed by Ungapo, who serves as the temporary leader of occupied Tibet, and it is later ratified by the Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, on June 24, 1947. Ungapo becomes a major force within Chinese politics and serves as Tibet province's representative in the legislative yuan for many years to come. When the Dalai Lama comes of age in 1953, the Chinese government appoints him governor for life of Tibet province, and in 1954, he and the Panchen Lama make a highly publicized trip to Nanjing, where they dine with Chiang Kai-shek and his family and make several speeches to the legislative yuan. While the loss of their independence is mourned by all Tibetans, they take solace in the fact that because of his firm belief in tradition and respect for religion, Chiang Kai-shek allows the Dalai Lama to stay in power and run Tibet according to his vision, so long as he pledges his allegiance to the Republic of China and runs the province as both the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people and the so-called democratically appointed leader of the Republic of China's Tibet province, in accordance with the three principles of the people. Because Chiang and the Nationalists were far more accepting of the Dalai Lama than Mao and the Communists were, no Tibetan uprisings ever occur, and by the 20th century, Tibet has largely come to terms with being part of China. With all of its former territory saved from Macau and Mongolia and now secured, China enters the next phase of the Great Leap Forward, which is the industrialization of China. From 1947 to 1949, President Chiang undertakes a variety of reforms. Firstly, with his power base now secure across China's workers and peasantry, as well as the upper class, Chiang entrusts his son, Chiang Qingkuo, to begin an anti-corruption campaign across China, replicating the similar success in Shanghai that his son had achieved the year prior. Many of China's most corrupt families are reined in. Only the four richest families of China, one of which Chiang married into, suspiciously emerge unscathed from the corruption probe. Although progress is slow, it is also during this time that the Chinese government takes its first steps towards reining in organized crime and the opium crisis, although this process is much slower than in our timeline under the communists. In 1947, Dai Li, the head of China's secret police, orchestrates multiple assassinations of China's remaining warlords, replacing them with loyal and semi-competent nationalist party cadres, who go on to integrate the warlord armies into the official Chinese military. Ironically, Dai Li himself is later assassinated by agents of Chiang Kai-shek, replaced by the political ally of Madame Chiang Kai-shek and OSS veteran Huang Ba-mei. These targeted assassinations are not discussed in China, as Chiang Kai-shek ensures that the media is heavily censored. Chiang Kai-shek succeeds in rapidly industrializing and rebuilding China through the use of foreign loans, which, due to Chiang Ching Kuo's anti-corruption efforts, mostly go to their intended destinations. By 1949, many of the major Chinese cities have fully recovered, although in the countryside this process is far slower. Furthermore, by 1949, China is fully integrated into the world economy and an active member of the United Nations. Lastly, Chiang ensures his army is completely overhauled, with American military advisors helping to rebuild the Chinese army by the end of the 1940s in preparation for a future military conflict. Whatever Chiang is planning, the Americans assume a move on Mongolia, President Harry Truman informs Chiang that while the United States will continue its current friendly relationship with China, it will not intervene militarily in support of Chiang's government. Chiang acknowledges this and presses forward. Unlike the US, in a private conversation during a state visit to Seoul, Chiang does get a pledge of support from Korean President Kim Gu, who promises Chiang that Korea will fight alongside China in a show of gratitude for his actions during the end of World War II. The spectacle of the Great Leap Forward's success does not go unnoticed around the world. In 1947, Captain John Birch of the United States Army 
publishes a book on his travels in China, including a meeting with President Chiang. The book, entitled White Sun Over China, becomes a bestseller in the United States and increases domestic support for the Republic of China even after the end of World War II. Alarmed by the fact that Chiang has not downsized his army, even after his recent victories, by 1949, the Soviet Union begins to grow worried that with China's rapid recovery, they may feel emboldened to attack Mongolia. In a speech before the United Nations, the Soviet representatives warn of a future Chinese invasion of the sovereign state of Mongolia. However, the Western bloc of nations, led by the United States, ensures that any UN condemnation of future Chinese aggression is vetoed. However, even many in China feel that a war in Mongolia, while resulting in a reclamation of lost land, may not be worth it. Chang knows this, and it is this unpopular view of a potential invasion of Mongolia that has stayed his hand thus far. However, Chang's rival, Chinese Premier Wang Jingwei, seeks to benefit from the controversy surrounding the Mongolian question. On April 4, 1950, Wang Jingwei holds a rally in Nanjing where he addresses concerns about a war with Mongolia to reclaim it. After all these years of playing the long game and kowtowing to Chiang Kai-shek, his most hated enemy, Wang's chances of seizing power are now better than ever. Wang Jingwei tells the crowd that in this post-war world, there is no dispute between civilized nations that cannot be resolved through diplomacy, and announces his wish to visit the Mongolian capital city of Ulaanbaatar and discuss a thaw in relations between Mongolia and China with Mongolian leader Marshal Choibalsan. Chang is furious at Wang's actions and realizes that he had grown a little too comfortable in their temporary truce since the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. However, Chang also sees an opportunity for himself. On April 10, 1950, former Japanese puppet leader and Mongolian nationalist Demchuk Dongrub is quietly released from house arrest in Nanjing and discreetly taken to the presidential palace. When he arrives, Chang tells Demchuk Dongrub that despite his past actions, the Republic of China is in a position to forgive him in exchange for his allegiance. Chang also makes it clear to Demchuk Dongrub that he will not be accepting no for an answer at this time. Chang also says that if Demchuk Dongrub works with him, he will install him as the governor of a unified Mongolian province with some autonomy. With his life on the line, Demchuk Dongrub agrees to Chang's proposal. On April 12, 1950, Chiang Kai-shek summons Wang Jingwei to his office. While Wang arrives expecting Chiang Kai-shek to berate him, he is shocked when Chiang greets him, sporting a calm demeanor. Chiang Kai-shek admits to Wang that in his recent fervor following the reclamation of so much territory, he may have bit off more than he could chew with the recent tensions in Mongolia, and asks if Wang was genuine in his speech a few days ago. Wang, not expecting this turn of events, agrees, and is then actually tasked with leading a diplomatic mission to Ulaanbaatar scheduled for June 24, 1950. Chiang Kai-shek clears Wang's visit in separate phone calls to Stalin and Mongolian leader Marshal Choibalsan, and the world breathes a sigh of relief at the fact that China and the Soviet Union are no longer on a collision course for war in Mongolia. However, covertly, Chiang Kai-shek has Huang Ba-mei and his most loyal men from the Chinese secret police deployed to the Mongolian border and informs his top generals, Sun Li Zhen and Li Mi, that China is now on a war footing. On June 23, 1950, at 10 p.m., Wang Jingwei's plane takes off from Da Jiaochang Airport in Nanjing, destined for the Ulaanbaatar summit the next day. Chiang Kai-shek himself is present to see Wang Jingwei off. However, as Wang's flight nears the border with Mongolia, a shot from an 85mm air defense gun rings out, striking Wang's plane. The plane crashes in Mongolia, with all aboard killed. The news reaches Chiang Kai-shek in Nanjing first. After all, it was his men who'd done it. Chiang Kai-shek ensures the news is disseminated to all major news outlets in China, as the world reels in horror at what has just transpired. Chiang waits a few hours to make a statement, as to not seem callous, but does rehearse his speech in private. At 5 p.m. on June 24, 1950, Chiang Kai-shek goes on air to comfort his grieving nation, who just lost the disciple of Sun Yat-sen himself, the hero of the people, Wang Jingwei. To my compatriots across China, today I too received the sad news from Mongolia that the great hero of the people, Wang Jingwei, who I served alongside in both the 1911 revolution and the anti-Japanese resistance war, 
has been murdered. As soon as I got the news, I immediately dispatched our best forensic experts to try and investigate, but they were denied entry into Mongolia by the Mongolian regional authorities. From what we have been able to gather, it seems that the Mongolian border guard was not properly briefed on the appearance of Wang Jingwei's plane, and thus mistook it for a warplane. We cannot let this grievous error go unpunished. If the Mongolian authorities think so little of our efforts to achieve peace that they cannot ensure the safety of our diplomats, then there is nothing left to discuss. We will answer their response tenfold and avenge the great Wang Jingwei. I have issued an emergency proclamation elevating the mayor of our great capital, Cheng Qingquo, to the office of premier. Order will be maintained. Immediately after President Chang's incendiary speech, Memorials for Wang Jingwei become protests, demanding justice for the slain national hero who'd put aside his own differences to aid President Chang in China's darkest hour. Across the capital of Nanjing, citizens get no sleep that night amidst the deafening cries across the city of Long Live Premier Wang and Justice for the Honorable Mr. Wang. On the morning of June 25, 1950, the Army and Air Force of the Republic of China led by Generals Sun Li Jin, Li Mi, Zhang Zhuiliang, and Ma Zhanshan, and aided by the armed forces of the Republic of Korea led by Yi Chang Chan, and the Mongolian Unity Army led by Dem Chug Dongrub, pour across the border into the Mongolian People's Republic. Mongolian leader Marshal Choi Bosan declares martial law across Mongolia, and begins a general mobilization and nationwide rationing. He also immediately contacts Moscow, which responds by deploying the Red Army to Mongolia to relieve Choibalsan's already faltering forces. The Soviet military operation in Mongolia is led by Soviet General Mao Anying, and he and his compatriots are the children of the communists slaughtered by the Chinese government all those years ago. Mao leads the charge into Mongolia to save Choibalsan, to save communist Mongolia, and to avenge his family. The Mongolian War, the first battle of the Cold War, has begun. As Chinese and Allied forces rush into Mongolia, Marshal Choibalsan's finest generals meet them at the town of Dalanzadgad on June 25th. However, it quickly becomes apparent that Mongolia's sparse population is its greatest weakness. Chinese forces take Dalanzadgad on June 27th after minimal resistance, with the city of Mandalgovi following on June 29th, thus clearing the pathway for the Chinese to advance straight to Ulaanbaatar to hopefully strike a killing blow to Mongolian forces. As these developments occur, Demchuk Dongrub takes to the airwaves. My fellow Mongols, these past few decades since the collapse of the old imperial order have been trying for all of us. Some may enjoy the so-called independence you now possess, but your independence is a lie. You exist as a vassal of communist imperialism. I too also once believed that we could be independent. But Mongolia's strategic location has left us vulnerable to imperialists on all sides. The Soviets wish to make you Russian. Their lapdog Choibalsan has willingly executed thousands of innocents without mercy. President Chiang Kai-shek rejects these Russian designs from Mongolia. He cares for us and our people. When President Chiang wins, and he will win, Inner and Outer Mongolia will finally be unified as a province of the democratic and sovereign Republic of China. We will be able to speak our language and practice our faith freely under his wise leadership. I urge all patriotic Mongols to resist the Russian imperialists and to welcome my Mongolian Unity Army and our Chinese and Korean brethren because our cause is just. Our cause is a free Mongolia. We will not rest until the Russian hands that form a stranglehold on our land have been hacked off and the country selling bandit Choibalsan is in the ground. Long live Mongolia. Long live the spirit of unity. Long live the three principles of the people. It was never truly understood the effect that Demchuk Dongrub's speech had on any Mongolians who were listening. What is well understood is that Choibalsan's forces, crumbling on the border regions, made a hasty retreat to Ulaanbaatar. Marshal Choibalsan rallies his citizens to resist the western sellouts and imperialists that are now closing in on the city. Choibalsan vows that the great Mongolian People's Republic will never fall. On July 4, 1950, Choibalsan flees Ulaanbaatar to link up with Mao Anying and the Red Army. On July 6, 1950, Ulaanbaatar falls to the National Revolutionary Army 
as China rejoices at their swift success thus far in the war. As most of Mongolia is reclaimed by China, immediately additional forces are dispatched to stabilize the vast region. After the fall of Ulaanbaatar, Joseph Stalin flies into a rage at Choibosan's incompetence. Were it not for the dire situation in Mongolia, he'd have had Choibosan executed at this very moment. However, Stalin is counting on Mao to relieve the besieged Mongolian people's army. As Choibosan and Mao link up, Choibosan orders a general retreat order for his troops to rally in preparation for a counterattack against the Chinese. Mao Anying leads the Red Army to a successful counterattack at the town of Setzerleg on the 10th of September, 1950. With Setzerleg under communist control, Mao then utilizes the town's strategic location to strike out at the Chinese troops and hopefully disrupt Chinese supply lines to slow the invasion in hopes of triggering a Mongol uprising sparked by Choibosan's speeches broadcast to the nation from Setzerleg. After several successful counterattacks, by October 1950, Mao becomes confident that the massive army he leads can retake Ulaanbaatar. On October 15, 1950, Mao's forces besieged the city of Ulaanbaatar. The Chinese, will dug in, did not expect such bold decisions from the communists, considering Mongolia was quickly falling under Chinese control. During the Battle of Ulaanbaatar, Li Tenghui, a Taiwanese soldier under the command of General Sun Li Jin, saves the lives of many soldiers with his quick thinking and becomes renowned across China as a war hero. Mao Anying's counterattack fails, but at a great personal cost for Chiang Kai-shek. A nationalist M4 Sherman tank battalion is encircled by communist forces during the battle, and its commanding officer, Chiang Kai-shek's son, Cheng Wei Kuo, is killed in action. After the failure of his counterattack, but his successful revenge on Chiang Kai-shek, Mao Anying attempts to regroup his forces and awaits instructions from Stalin. However, at this point in the war, Stalin's attention is now drawn towards a massive strike in East Germany, defying Soviet authority amidst news of their losses in Mongolia. While originally Stalin planned to interview the Mongolian border guards to learn the truth of Wang Jingwei's death, these plans have since been foiled, as the entire border guard has either deserted their posts or been executed by Chinese invaders. With multiple crises developing across the Soviet Union's borders, Stalin decides to cut his losses in Mongolia, a country of just one million people and causing massive embarrassment to the Soviets, and instead chooses to focus on the more geopolitically important East Germany. So be it, Stalin was reported to have said. Let the Chinese be our neighbors. On November 13, 1950, the Soviet Union and the Republic of China sign a peace agreement in Nanjing, and the Red Army begins its withdrawal from Mongolia. One key portion of the peace agreement sees China relinquish all of its claims to territory currently controlled by the Soviet Union, including Tuva. Despite the Soviet withdrawal, Mao Anying and his closest associates decide to fight on and refuse to follow orders to withdraw. Choibosan, now backed into a corner, accepts Mao's help as the two men remain committed to fighting until the end. Mao Anying and Choibosan are both captured during a surprise attack on their encampment by Chinese forces on November 25, 1950. Mao Anying and Choibosan are caught off guard in the mess hall, making egg fried rice. The capture of Mao and Choibosan ends the last remaining organized resistance in Mongolia to Chinese rule. The next few months would see the men interrogated and tortured at a black site in Manchuria. On March 15, 1951, a prison transport containing Mao Anying and Marshal Choibosan, both badly beaten and filthy, arrives in the Chinese capital city of Nanjing. The patriotic crowd of Chinese jeer the transport as it drives through the streets of the capital, which are decorated with the Chinese flag and images of the president, Chiang Kai-shek. Both men are tried in a kangaroo court and charged with separatism, treason, and affiliating with the communist movement. On May 1st, 1951, Mao Anying, the last major leader of the communist movement in China, and Marshal Choibosan, the last leader of an independent Mongolia, are hung in Nanjing before the public. With their deaths, the century of humiliation is all but ended, as China has now reclaimed all of its major former territory except Macau. However, China is patient with the Portuguese and accepts that Macau will return in due time. On June 5, 1951, the province of Mongolia is formally created, with Demchug Dongrub as its governor. There is a wave of simmering anger across all of Mongolia, following the humiliating revocation of their independence, and quietly, an independence movement grows while the Chinese are none the wiser. 
For the rest of the 1950s, Chiang Kai-shek further works to consolidate his power under the excuse of tutelage and regularly purges disloyal factions in the nationalist movement. Living conditions continued to rise in China, as well as national patriotism, as the retaking of Mongolia was a massive public relations victory for Chiang Kai-shek's continued rule and the nationalist movement. By the mid-1950s, a cult of personality centered around the Chiang family is created, and Chiang Kai-shek takes on an almost mythical status to some of his more devout followers. However, even as living conditions continue to improve, the human rights situation in Chiang Kai-shek's China remains abysmal. Dissidents are regularly detained, tortured, and executed without due process, and there is no freedom of speech or press. Looking back, historians estimate that tens of thousands of civilians were killed by Chiang Kai-shek's government during the White Terror. Across the rest of Asia, the United States and China work together to ensure continued stability. Memorable moments of the Sino-American relationship in the 1950s include helping to rebuild Japan's economy via trade after the United States occupation ends there in 1953, joint support of the new Korean Republic, and a vast cultural exchange between China and the United States throughout the 1950s, which results in a burgeoning tourist industry within China, as well as the birth of a vibrant Chinese underground counterculture inspired by American rock and roll music. In 1950s Korea, President Kim Gu's popularity remains high, and he democratically rules the nation until his death in 1961. In spite of the cooperation between the American and Chinese republics, this alternate universe China is not as close to the US as the rump government on Taiwan was in our timeline. In 1956, alongside India, Yugoslavia, and Egypt, the Republic of China becomes a founding member of the non-aligned movement, with Chiang Kai-shek serving as the organization's first chair from 1956 to 1961. The participation of the Republic of China in the non-aligned movement represents a growing desire amongst many in the Chinese government for China to carve its own path going forward, independent of both the U.S. and the USSR, while still remaining on good terms with the U.S. Amidst unrest in Vietnam, in 1955, the Republic of China secretly intervenes to ensure the government of the Vietnamese emperor, Bao Yai, does not fall to a communist insurrection or palace coup. While the intervention is successful, Bao Yai goes on to require perpetual covert support from Chiang's government to serve as a bulwark against communism in Vietnam, and due to the two nations' complicated history, this support is kept top secret. Likewise, similar operations are undertaken for the monarchs of Laos and Cambodia. Going forward, China maintains warm relations with the kingdoms of Cambodia, Thailand, Bhutan, and Laos, as well as the Empire of Vietnam as all of these countries begin to enter China's sphere of influence. On March 10, 1959, the Mongolian uprising occurs. Mongolians fill the streets of Ulaanbaatar to protest Chinese rule and demand that their independence be returned to them. When news of these protests reaches the bustling capital of Nanjing, Chiang Kai-shek orders the governor of Mongolia, Demchuk Dongrub, to declare martial law in Mongolia province and deploy the National Revolutionary Army to Ulaanbaatar to quell the protests. Reluctantly, Demchuk Dongrub acquiesces to the government's wishes. When the crowds of Mongolian protesters refuse to disperse, the army opens fire and kills roughly 500 unarmed protesters. When the Soviet Union protests this action in the United Nations, the Chinese delegation claims that the protesters were paid protesters, sent by the Soviet Union to encourage separatism. The Chinese ambassador to the UN warns the Soviets to not meddle in Chinese affairs or disrespect China's national sovereignty. China then institutes a crackdown in Mongolia, where both pro-independence and communist Mongols are arrested, tortured, and killed, crippling any chances of an effective independence movement, with the death toll eventually reaching 40,000. While China succeeds in putting down the protests, it remains a black mark in Chinese history, with any mention of the massacres in Mongolia being forbidden for decades to come. The 1960s sees an aging President Chiang Kai-shek pass more responsibilities to his son, Cheng Ching Kuo. In 1961, Cheng Ching Kuo is elevated from the office of premier to that of vice president. Furthermore, with Nikita Khrushchev's reforms, it is in this decade that China and the Soviet Union re-established diplomatic relations, beginning with the 1960 Sino-Soviet Thaw. Perhaps the biggest story of 1963 in the Republic of China is the beginning of one of the most successful propaganda campaigns in modern Chinese history. During a China Youth Corps night rally in Nanjing in 1963, Chiang Ching Kuo presents to the audience a new book entitled Li Junfan's Diary. 
The diary is that of a 23-year-old soldier and martial artist from Hong Kong named Lee Jun Fan, and is filled with the details of his life, including his intense faith in Chinese nationalism and admiration for President Chiang Kai-shek. The propaganda campaign presents Lee Jun Fan as the ideal man of Chiang Kai-shek's China, physically fit, disciplined in mind and body, masculine, and patriotic to the core. Furthermore, the diary discusses how Lee was just four years old when he witnessed the liberation of Hong Kong by the National Revolutionary Army, and it was this event that shaped the young boy's life. He devoted his life to martial arts and quickly became a local celebrity in Hong Kong. After joining the Chinese army at age 18, his training made him the perfect fit to become a strong leader, an excellent soldier in service of China. Soon, the diary becomes a bestseller, no doubt because of government-manipulated sales numbers, but regardless, the story of Li Jun Fan becomes a hit in China, and the young man himself helps to promote the book on a nationwide tour, even appearing with President Chiang at several political gatherings and rallies. After the end of the successful propaganda campaign, Chiang Kai-shek pulls some strings to ensure Li Jun Fan can continue his martial arts career, but this time on the big screen. Li Jun Fan becomes a global icon of modern China and helps to break down stereotypes about Chinese and Asian men in general in the West. Embodying the new China, Li Jun Fan goes on to have a prolific film career, even breaking into the Western movie market, where he goes by the name Bruce Lee. Lee reaches the peak of his fame in the 1980s, but continues to enjoy a successful career long afterward, and his image remains an enduring icon in Chinese culture for decades to come. Another one of the biggest news stories in China during the 1960s is the career of an up-and-coming politician from Taiwan, Governor Li Tenghui, who, while originally a soldier for Japan, became a Chinese war hero during the Mongolian War. Li Tenghui's wise leadership as the governor of Taiwan province becomes a source of national pride, as under him, Taiwan becomes one of the most prosperous provinces of China. Yet another momentous event of the 1960s in China is the death of General Ma Zhanshan, savior of Manchuria, who passes away in 1964 at age 78, although his memory lives on in the grateful people of Manchuria. President Chiang Kai-shek declares a week of mourning and personally attends General Ma's funeral in Mukden, where he is interred with his men at the Manchu Salvation Army Memorial Cemetery. On the 26th of April, 1974, the Carnation Revolution occurs in Portugal, in which their dictatorship is overthrown by a peaceful mass uprising. In the aftermath of the Carnation Revolution, Chinese troops seized the Portuguese colony of Macau after brief negotiations with the new left-wing government in Portugal on the matter. At long last, China has undone the last vestige of the century of humiliation. On the 10th of December, 1978, Chiang Kai-shek, the determined and ruthless dictator of the Republic of China for 50 years, dies at age 91. One week of mourning is proclaimed as Chiang's son, Chiang Ching Kuo, takes power as the next president of China. Chiang Kai-shek's time in power remains controversial for the rest of recorded Chinese history with many fans and detractors of his strongman, authoritarian rule. The following week, as a tribute to the life of the late president, a song entitled White Sun in the Sky is released as a memorial to him. Decades later, this song goes on to be very popular as an internet meme amongst both fans and detractors of Chiang Kai-shek, especially after being covered by a Nigerian singer known as Three Principles How. The rest of the 1970s and the 1980s goes much the same as it did in our timelines Taiwan. President Chiang Ching Kuo inherits a booming Chinese economy and fully unified China from his father, but one without a real democracy, as Chiang Kai-shek considered his time in power to be the tutelage phase of the great Dr. Sun Yat-sen's plan for China. Because of this, President Chiang Ching Kuo's tenure as president is spent converting China from state capitalist authoritarianism to a true democracy much like he did in Taiwan in our timeline. As his vice president, Chiang Ching Kuo selects the governor of Taiwan province, Li Tang Hui. On October 10, 1988, Chinese president Chiang Ching Kuo passes away aged 78. He is succeeded by his vice president and protege, Li Tang Hui. Li is sworn in that same day, albeit with some pushback from party elites who are only cowed into submission by President Li's threat to notify the Chinese public of their defiance of President Chiang's last wish, which was for Li to ascend to the presidency. Li continues Chiang's reforms going into 1989, and a few days after his inauguration on December 1, 1989, President Li holds a press conference broadcast across all of China, 
where he informs the nation that he will continue President Chiang Ching Kuo's reforms and that there will be a free and fair election across China in 1995. In 1995, President Li keeps his promise and manages to hold a free and fair election across China, which he wins by 55% of the vote against several minor parties. After serving a five-year term, Li Tanghui leaves office in 2000 after another election in which he does not participate. This time, Dr. Fang Li Ji wins the presidency as the Chinese Progressive Party nominee, ending nearly 80 years of nationalist rule. In 2001, the Zhuangtang Emperor passes away in his palace in the Forbidden City at the age of 95. The funeral ceremony is a momentous occasion, as it marks the last time the people of China bury an emperor. With the Zhuangtang Emperor's death, the imperial era of China enters history, as the people of China mourn the loss. President Fang Liji proclaims a week of mourning, and on the day of the emperor's funeral, crowds gather in Beijing to see the emperor off on his final journey to the imperial crypts, with his coffin draped in the flag of the old imperial dynasty. The Republic of China enters the 21st century as a first world democracy. There are no wars left for them to fight. Their past may be checkered, especially concerning Mongolia, but for the most part, they have succeeded in undoing the injustices committed against them during the century of humiliation. East Asia is firmly within China's sphere of influence, with the Republic of Korea as China's closest ally. Furthermore, throughout the decades, China and Japan have managed to become closer in terms of international relations, and there is nowhere near the animosity between the two in this alternate timeline as there is in ours. Likewise, the Sino-American relationship is as strong as ever, without much of the animosity that permeates the Sino-American relationship of our timeline. With China on track to become the world's largest economy by 2025, enjoying a vibrant democracy, and with a standard of living higher than ever before experienced in Chinese history, it seems that Dr. Sun Yat-sen's dream of democracy has finally been realized after all these years.